The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com. Good evening, friends uh, and colleagues, uh, both in Ukraine and worldwide. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Vyacheslav Pokatili, and on behalf of uh, uh, Mimki Business School, welcome you on Reinforce UA project. Uh, this project was designed in order to inspire Ukrainian business community and bring uh, world-known intellectual uh, um, with ideas that currently are widely discussed in the world. And they could uh, widen also discussion within Ukraine, especially in this time when we are uh, uh, suffering uh, the war, uh, and but looking forward to, to our victory and to a new reinforcement, new recovery, uh, and new, 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 new restoration of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, uh, we are very grateful uh, uh, to our sponsor. This project was uh, become possible uh, due to the uh, support of Bogdan Havrilichin Family Foundation, 50 Thinkers Organization, and three uh, major uh, business uh, education organization, business school organization, business management organization, um, AACSB, uh, AMBA, and, and EFMD. We are grateful for all donations you have made already on our site, uh, and uh, I remind you that all donations, all money collected, will be uh, directed to support uh, temporarily displaced uh, women from Ukraine uh, who want uh, to start their own businesses. Um, before I shall give the floor to our uh, prominent guest today, I'd like to remind you that all sessions uh, are recorded uh, and um, will be available uh, afterwards uh, 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 offline. Uh, I mean, uh, in YouTube's and our side, uh, but uh, also you can ask questions today uh, now to to uh, to our guests. Uh, uh, but please use for this purpose Q and A button rather than chat. Uh, and now uh, I have a special uh, honor and privilege and, and and pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Mark Esposito. Uh, he is recognized internationally as top global thought leader in matters related to fourth uh, industrial revolution, the change in opportunities in technology uh, that would bring a uh, <clears throat> variety of industry. He's co-founder and chief learning officer at Nexus Frontier Tech, uh, an artificial scale-up venture. Um, he's advisor to, uh, uh, to, to governments and currently is advisor to United Arab Emirates uh, uh, government. Um, He's expert in the World Economic Forum, advisor to um, a, a fellow in the UNESCO Chair and Future Literacy of Finance, um, professor of business economics in Holt uh, International Business School and Harvard uh, University Division of Continuous Education. At Harvard, he serves as an institute council co-leader at the Microeconomics of Competitiveness Program. Uh, at the Institute of Strategy and Competitiveness of, uh, of uh, Professor Michael Porter. He's, he has authored and co-authored over 150 publications and a number of books, among which are bestsellers, uh, um, in particular, Understanding How the Future Unfolds, published uh, in 2017. His uh, recent books uh, in, in his course and with Amit Kapoor um, is devoted to fourth industrial revolution in, in emerging economy. And the new book uh, that will be published uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is titled The Great Remobilization, Designing a Smarter World. He, is a doctoral he has a doctoral degree in business and economics from uh, Ecole de Pont Paris Tech. I, I pronounced in French badly. Uh, uh, sorry, Mark. And actually, it's not even mentioned here in my text uh, that you're also a director of CDC um, um, uh, in Paris, uh, which I assume is also one of the posts. It's, it's you know, it, it's it's a lot and. Um, you know, it's probably a, a, a hard life to live with such a um, huge amount of titles, Mark. Uh, I'm very pleased to give you the floor and looking forward to uh, learning uh, about uh, uh, about your recent uh, publications and books. Slava, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be part of this initiative. 
Uh, many uh, friends and colleagues have already been through uh, the conversation with you uh, before, and I look forward to the uh, question that we're going to have today coming from the audience. So it was a very, uh, very honor when the friends from Thinker50 uh, extend an invitation to be part of this, and uh, I look forward to uh, what we'll be able to do together uh, with the purpose of, uh, of course, uh, reconstruct but also a reinforce Ukraine after the victory and that's a common goal that I like to share as well. Uh, today uh, the conversation will be about the forthcoming book uh, that we are going to publish uh, with MIT University Press uh, called The Great Remobilization. As Lava has rightly said is uh, my next work and it's probably uh, the most important one for a number of reasons. Uh, before starting my presentation, I'd like to give you a, a bit of context. Uh, we're living probably in the most significant decades uh, for many of us, uh, simply because we see that we are moving from one set of, uh, of uh, industrial policy that serve us very well for the 20th century, at least in a part of the world that's largely benefited from uplifting from poverty all the way down to industrial, industrial era, the rise of technologies, the, the internet, and fundamentally a significant degree of prosperity. Um, but we also noticed that our system is becoming more fragile. We started to notice already pre-COVID that our global system was going under a lot of pressure. COVID was clearly a sign that our uh, resilience was not as, as uh, we thought it was. It took us some time before we could figure this out. And the, the current conflict in Ukraine is showing also that geopolitically we are reshaping, of course, the conversation about the future. So probably these are the most significant period of our history, especially if you are like me in my late 40s and you are nonetheless remembering the world before and looking forward also to what is going to be happening forward. I have done this project with two other uh, colleagues, friends, uh, people that I trust greatly, uh, Professor Olaf Groth, who is a professor at Haas, um, the UC Berkeley in California, and Professor Terence, who is a professor at uh, Halt International Business School. Um, and together with Terence, we've been writing uh, a couple of books prior to this. So it's been my writing companion for now over 15 years. So let me, if that's okay with all of you, share a screen. I'd love for you to uh, maybe share with me a thumb up that uh, you can see the screen. So I know that I'm not uh, um, just talking in a blank. Uh, you should be able to see it now. Uh, if that is the case, let me see whether, great. I see a thumb up moving up. So here is uh, the journey of today. Um, I'd like to engage with you for a little bit of time. I'll try to be mindful uh, not to be uh, extending myself too much, uh, but eventually uh, getting to the Q&A, which is really where, uh, when I did the uh, preparation call together with our, our my new friends um, from MIM, I was telling them the anticipation I really have about the opportunity to really learn from your question. So here is the story. Um, the work is, this is not yet the cover of the book, this was the poster that was announcing uh, our work. Um, we are ambitious in trying to uh, engage our readers uh, into the idea of becoming design activists. When we talk about design activism, we're really talking about the opportunity that we need to have in rethinking most of our uh, architecture of the world, the way we see this today. It really is a big uh, think book in the sense that it's inspired to move uh, critical masses of people. They're going to be actively involved in reconstructing our foundations. This is for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, because we start to notice that it's not just the, um, a problem that is systematic to a specific area. For example, the economy or just society or demographics. Uh, or geopolitics. We started to notice that the transformation are occurring across the board, and we wanted to know is start asking questions to people that we consider to be thought leaders. And we uh, start to engage in a conversation around where are we heading? And which direction do we uh, see forthcoming moving forward? 
So the first major findings that we really um, started to realize, this was already visible both in the work from Professor Olaf, who had written about the relationship between uh, humans and machines, and the work I have done together with Terence and another co-author, Danny Go, um, about the relationship between intelligent automation and, and machines and humans. We started to realize that the relationship between human and machine is largely changing. I will equally try to make it uh, relevant to the idea of uh, the future of Ukraine. Um, as a country that likely will see a leap towards the degree of digitization that is required uh, for an economy to become a digital economy, for a country to eventually start competing in the global market, and also for a country that is going to have a major turn from the past looking forward. Uh, clearly, technology is in the future of Ukraine, like technology is in the future of most of our economies, if not all of them. But more than this, it's not just about digitalization. Uh, I know there is already in Ukraine a Minister of Digital Transformation, which has been also been very active throughout the war in trying to really engage how technology can bypass a limit limitation that we have on the ground. Um, we've been thinking, hearing, reading about digital transformation lines to uh, remember the digital transformation is already a quite a seasoned concept. It was introduced uh, at the beginning of the millennial. We're, we're looking at 2010, roughly, as a way of rethinking how do we turn our processes into uh, digital. Today, we're no longer just about digital era. We are shifting into a cognitive area in which more and more technologies will be shaped around the brain. The brain will equally become one of the larger form of feedback we're going to have about technology and conceptual model that will inspire algorithms and also, of course, the kind of deep technology that will follow once we're shifting to frontier tax, quantum computing, and advanced cloud. So these are some of the conversations that started to really uh, form themselves across the interviews we were having. What does it mean for a society to move into a cognitive era? Fundamentally, it means, ladies and gentlemen, that we're going to deal with problems that we have never seen before because we have no precedence. We have no way to really have a blueprint coming from the past. For example, the conversation on the metaverse is a conversation that will keep on shaping up. We will see likely cities in Ukraine and around the world appearing on the metaverse and starting to use digital twins to navigate across. We can think about this as a digital museum, for example, but it can also become a digital hospital or you can use telemedicine to have access to some of the best doctors in the world and digital ecosystem. It could also become a quite dangerous place, uh, difficult to have a jurisdiction. What happens if a crime happens in the metaverse? And some of these questions are going to have happen more or less on a daily basis as we enter into an entirely different sense of identity with all of this. So the cognitive era was the very first important part that we start to think this is different. We're shifting into a period of time in our history where the role of technologies will no longer be about industrial policy that is designed for more efficiency. The idea of competitiveness will no longer work according to the traditional form of competing on comparative advantages and moving in a sophisticated value chains from what seems to be simple to more sophisticated and innovation-driven economies. There will be a, a coefficient of technology that will largely reshape geopolitics on a global level. And we already see this today with the race against US and China not being fundamentally about trade, but fundamentally about surveillance, technology, and of course, artificial intelligence. This cognitive umbrella that we have really uh, discovered was really resonating with us in a number of different ways. So what you're about to see is probably the most important part, the structure or the architecture of our work. Uh, we call it in this presentation, the six C's because we're introducing cognification, which is what I just mentioned. In the book, we will refer to them as the five C's because we find the cognification as the umbrella. But just because of the fact that this is a short presentation, um, it, I wanted to make sure that I make the differentiation between why you see six C's here and on the book you will find five because quantification is considered to be kind of uh, the umbrella.
And what does it stand for, this slide? Well, we want to understand the operating system of Globalization 2.0. Uh, globalization 2.0 is also how we will run some of our courses around the world, um, trying to really rethinking strategies. And you'll notice that the five uh, elements or the five buckets that start with C, they mean something for all of us. The first one is COVID-19, not because we are going back to the fear or we are overly stressed in the conversation on the pandemic, but because of what COVID has really triggered and open up to. Uh, it was truly an accelerant, as we all know. Um, the angle we're taking in our book was how much COVID changed the internet. And we're gonna go back there shortly. The second big bucket was really to understand crypto. We are rethinking money. Uh, very likely a country like Ukraine will no longer be able to play according to traditional monetary policy. It will have to be equally present in digital currencies because it's the only way we have to really start expanding the idea of financial capacity, especially when we might need to reconstruct, we might want to rethink in trade, when we might want to attract partners that are gonna be reliable and working with us, maybe different from before. So the idea of crypto likely will continue to shape not only the extension of the web, but also the way we are generating financial transactions. This means that from rethinking digital wallets to understanding currencies, not only the traditional forms of crypto like Bitcoin, but the whole idea about tokenization, the fact that we're thinking about tokens rather than traditional uh, systems of financial control through central banks is also quite interesting um, story because he epitomized fundamentally the difference from before. We're shifting from concentration to diffusion. We're going from convergence to divergence. There's some degree of fragmentation that we see happening. This fragmentation is also very regional, but that doesn't mean that we're gonna be decoupled from the global economy. It simply means that regional narratives and regional mandates and agendas will likely drive the uh, progress forward if integrated inside of a global scaled network which is really where we see the opportunities. But as we're moving more into digital structure in which even money is becoming nothing more than a transaction between zeros and ones, how about our security? We're currently very, very weak in terms of cybersecurity. We already know a lot about the challenges with hacking that happened back in the days during uh, elections in the United States. We've been hearing during the war uh, how Russia was trying to hack the security system of Ukraine. But hacking in general is not just about country, it can also be about hacking banks, hacking database, hacking medical research, hacking patents. We're really underrepresented and we have undercapacity in terms of cybersecurity. We are uh, more and more dependent on technology for the creation of value, but we're also much more dependent on securing the value in the same way we generate this. So our entire idea about cyber is still an area that is under development and likely in the future of Ukraine, a strong understanding of cybersecurity of a country that will likely start building more and more digital capacity will be important. The last two buckets, just to give you a sense of the direction of our conversations, are really planetary challenges that we're going to have. The first one is a planetary challenge. The second one, it will be fundamentally more about uh, the role that China has on a global level. But let's start from climate change. We are going to see more and more implication of climate change uh, in global scale. This is not only about the temperature of the world becoming warmer, but it's also about rethinking our entire economy and human geography with the understanding of climate. So climate credits will become more visible we'll start thinking more about net zero, which is already a movement that is taking significant uh, shape. We talk more about climate mitigation and climate adaptation, less about climate change. We're almost like getting to the point of understanding that climate is not reversible to what it used to be 30, 40, 50 years ago, but much more about the fact that climate is much more volatile 
And therefore, we're going to see more fluctuations, more events of uh, large scales, more events that might be, to some extent, disruptive. So rethinking our climate economy really is at the very beginning of a different form of energy, but also a way for us to rethink in, in which way we're going to mitigate the impact without necessarily losing competitiveness and prosperity. I'll be using several times the idea of prosperity and competitiveness because I know that from uh, uh, the talk with another colleague of mine, Dr. Kettles, you've been uh, brought back into the conversation about competitiveness and competitive Ukraine. Well, no country will actually have any chance to be competitive unless we are addressing the mitigation necessary for climate. And this is an important part that we kept on discovering as we were, of course, uh, discovering the findings of our book. And the final bucket is, of course, China. How do we see China playing a role in the global economy? We already saw today that throughout the last few years, no matter whether it was about because of the, the trade war between the US and China, or it was about the semiconductors, or it was about the political position of China against the war or in favor of it, or whether it was about supply chain or the shipping cost. Today, China is no longer just a country, it is an entire system of reference. It's a system running almost in a contention with the original Western one. We start having banks of development that are challenging the idea of the World Bank, the Asia Infrastructure Development Bank, when it was introduced in 2015, was the first of its kind to fundamentally challenge the mission of the World Bank that had been around for several decades, since 1944. We started to notice that China initiated the most ambitious infrastructural project of uh, mankind, shifting infrastructure moving from Shanghai to Lisbon, going through the Middle East, cutting corridor through Pakistan, on the way to the Indian Ocean. Of course, crossing to Central Asia and getting into Africa. The trade with Africa is significant high. Infrastructure in Africa is largely developed by construction companies who are coming from China. And in these two fields, construction, therefore infrastructure and technology, China is really positioned to move forward, not without problems. The country is nonetheless facing challenges. But we have today seven of the 10 larger construction companies originally from China, and nine of the 20 larger technology companies are actually Chinese. And if we're looking at technologies like artificial intelligence and the venture capital investment moving into the field, half of this goes to China. The rest is divided between US, Europe, and the rest of the world. So China is not only a country, ladies and gentlemen, is an entire point of reference of an alternative systems of growth that needs to be put into the perspective. So what I did in uh, this uh, initial conversation with you was to give you a sense about where we see the reconstruction of the world moving. To summarize more and more into this relationship between humans and machine, reshaping job, reshaping the relationship we have on low, uh, dealing with ethical dilemmas we've never seen before. We start to notice how COVID has fundamentally changed the internet and our ability to deal with that. More crypto means rethinking finance, rethinking money. Cybersecurity, rethinking how we say, protect ourselves from, from hazard and threats. Climate change is rethinking in terms of mitigation and adaptation, and China as a, an alternative system of reference. Now, these were some of the important findings that we had in our work when we actually started to put together. And on a more micro level, what happens to uh, the relationship between markets and consumers? They are very macro levels that we've been talking about right now. What about users and consumers? Many of uh, our, um, you know, our spectator, uh, watcher, listeners, they might come from a business environment dealing with the private sector. And so what we did, we started to really see within the larger trends, some other trends that we actually call tectonic shifts. So shifts, they're moving us into a direction of creating new 
select landscapes of reference. I'm gonna share with you a few ideas that will kind of bring me over to a point where I love for us to uh, finish my presentation and get into the Q&A uh, to make sure that we can get into a more animated exchange between us. So within the macro view, what are the more micro ones? So in cognification, we started to realize that a few things were basically becoming very, very visible. Let me try to share with you some of them. The first one, shifting more and more from the traditional product and uh, consumers to a hybrid between humans, products, value chains. This is why we're going to go more into the uh, micro. This is when we see already people becoming part of their research and development. We start using technology. They are listening to us. They're doing what we tell them to do. They're placing orders for us. Some of us are having internet of things at home. We have companies that have produced uh, products like Alexa or Siri. They are actually designed to support us into some form of technology mediated environment. But at the same time, as we're interacting with the smart technologies, we're constantly feeding the technology with our information. Somehow we are becoming the product, not only because some of these are basically uh, free, it's because we have become part of the research and development. We are embedded into the design of products. So what is the role of humans in the future? We likely will have to reconsider important roles like privacy, like property rights. But also, is it fair that some of our data generates billions of dollars for somebody, but there is no redistribution of that value directly to us? So rethinking dividends, rethinking the role of governments, we'll also have to take into account the fact that many organizations, as we introduce in more technologies, are shifting humans to become part of the value chain. That's the very first shift that we start to find more critical at the micro level that likely will shape the competitiveness of firms in many ways. The second one is related to outside in to inside out. This time we're talking much more about fundamentally the brain. We're looking at how the brain is largely shaping some of our most uh, sophisticated uh, artificial intelligence models. We have much more behavioral economics today than just traditional economics in trying to understand consumers. We use technology to try to influence and condition people into specific kinds of behaviors. Social media has become the place in which many interactions are really happening. We're shifting much more to micro interaction on digital. We alter our appearance through filters and, and using companies they're fundamentally changing the way we see each other. There's a lot of challenges that we see in rethinking technology shape around the power of the brain. So that's another important shape uh, that we start to realize more and more as we were moving to the conversation that we're getting into, how are we really changing um, the micro side of the story? So if the brain will likely condition a lot of this, there are a couple of more um, shifts I wanna share with you. The third one is really to think about data. We're shifting data much more on a global level than the concentration of data as it used to be. It shows that data is becoming multilateral, not only data going west to east, but now we have data going east to west, and we equally have a lot of data exchanges north to south and south to east and south to north, which basically means that on a global level, more and more countries are actually developing data strategies. Therefore, they are becoming more competitive regardless of their size. That's another conversation about the future of Ukraine, how critical data will be used to reconstruct digital systems. How do we structure this? What kind of algorithm will we have? This is an, another important shift that we found becoming very visible moving forward. And I leave you with the last two. The fourth is the decentralization through cognitive power, rethinking much more about democratizing data for big and small medium enterprises. Data becoming portable, data becoming as a service, technology as a service, 
likely will make it possible for many small medium enterprises to be part of the global economy. This is not only just the wishful thinking, it's really where the Web3, as the evolution of the internet, triggered fundamentally by how the internet has changed during COVID, uh, has likely empowered millions of people to be much more micro entrepreneurs because we have access to information that we did not have before. From farmers who can control uh, crops, fertilizer, water, to small medium enterprises that can use some open innovation to run their digital transformation. This is probably one of the things that I see empowering the small medium enterprise in Ukraine, becoming largely digitized and be able to be part of the global economy with original orientation. The last shift we see is if data is going to become so critically distributed, it also means the data will become by itself a market. Therefore, we'll see more and more of a dynamic pricing mechanism that we redefine markets, we redefine fluctuation of prices. It is a different way of rethinking capitalism in many ways. So no more large industrial uh, territory with access to commodities capable of turning them into some form of manufacturing services later on innovation, but we'll equally have to add to the conversation we're going to have, the conversation on data and how we'll see data fundamentally playing a major role because data will become a market on its own. So think, for example, if by going from one location to the other, you carry your data with you, data by itself has a value. And therefore, this valuation of data will likely continue to happen in the next few years, rethinking fundamentally market dynamics. So I could talk more about this, but this is also the time where I'd love for us to move into some Q&A, because I hope that with the so like 25, uh, 30 minutes I have, to talk to you about the role of uh, the great remobilization. You can feel where this great architecture is emerging from the work we have done. How does this connect to the competitiveness idea that you have with Dr. Kettles? But also more importantly, what is the direction that Ukraine likely will have to undertake moving out of the current situation after the victory? And this is lava where I leave to you um, the uh, conversation with the Q&A and the facilitation. If that's okay, I'm stopping my share so uh, that I can see. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, obviously, I would need to, to read carefully uh, the book. Uh, um, you raised uh, quite a lot of uh, not easy ideas, by the way, um, and um, there was well discussion, and, and we have uh, uh, just 20 minutes uh, to, to address only some. Uh, I like your frameworks, uh, and you proposed one of these major frameworks of the 6C, Let's uh, uh, shorten it to four because I would unite crypto and, and security. Sure. Um, and, and, and I'd like to ask the four questions. It also bothered me uh, personally a, a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the idea to go to crypto uh, was, was driven to some extent with uh, uh, some kind of a suspicious uh, attitude of, of citizens towards government, of central banks, uh, and all the centralized. Uh, 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 centralized um, uh, ideas about how money are printed and uh, transferred, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was not the only idea. I would not insist on this, but right. it's one of the ideas. Um, understandable. Uh, when I was young and uh, and and still mathematician, the, the, the idea of distribution databases was 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 well known. This was not nothing nothing new. It, at that time, it in this sense called this um, uh, let's say blockchains, etc. Uh, so, uh, so it is also very democratic, you know, people keep and don't depend on central governments. Great. Mm -hmm. But then comes the story about internet, which by the way was not uh, perfect still, we, we sometimes uh, didn't hear you uh, and, and so uh, clearly. Uh, and then there's a physical support. And because of economy of scale, data centers are huge. And will become more huge. And even now, they are concentrated in hands of a few private companies. Yes. Now, down comes some of kind of a philosophical question which bothered me. How can we speak about this distribution uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, databases, uh, cryptos, uh, uh, when everything is stored in a few data centers? And as China yeah. uh, showed, in particular, just to 
jumping into this uh, final seat, uh, this can be moved differently, you know, towards either government or a private uh, a private ownership. And then comes the question how to control these private firms with such an enormous power towards people and their data. Uh, then we come like a closed loop, um, uh, you know, uh, trying to avoid the government. We ask now the government to 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 somehow to support yeah. us uh, uh, from uh, to to hide us from from a private scheme. So that that loop bothered me personally, and as you of touch course. it, almost uh, I would really appreciate your your thoughts about it. Thanks for this, Lava. Great point to start, and I, I do appreciate. It. Um, so I think when uh, we were talking about crypto in the book, we're no longer talking just about traditional cryptocurrencies, but we're rethinking uh, crypto as a way of creating value alternative from the traditional systems, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of um, uh, rewarding, for example, social work or charity or, or things that are meaningful. Who they are not necessarily come from the traditional centralized system. I'm going to give you a quick example. There are in uh, Eastern Europe uh, countries that are using cryptocurrency to reward volunteer. They're helping children crossing the street during the daytime, right? And that's a way for them to find a, an alternative form of reward system that later on can become financial, but didn't come from the traditional monetary policy. one. So there are examples that we have been able to rethink in money as a form of trust as he originally was, rather than money controlled fundamentally by very few players. But we're still far from where we should be. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, lack of regulation that needs to be in place. One of the things that I didn't mention, but that I'm a strong believer, uh, governance of this technology is critical. We eat because it's licensed by somebody that says it's not poisonous. Uh, we buy toys that are not going to hurt our children right? Um, we buy pharmaceutical only if we have a prescription when they are a little bit more dangerous than having an aspirin. So we should have uh, governance of technology in the same way as we have for many of our assets, which brings me to the second part, part of your questions. These large technology companies need to start working with government for governance and be regulated. I know it sounds naive, but today, large companies like Nestle, Unilever, Procter & Gamble fundamentally decide how we brush our teeth, what we eat on our tables, right? And what kind of product we're using. But they have gone through a degree of regulation that makes them conform to the standard what we consider to be safe, uh, protecting citizens to some extent, or even levels on food allow us to make choices on how we want to feed ourselves. So I think that we are uh, in deep need of governing technology at the country levels, but more important at the regionals level. And I'll try to make an example, Slava. Countries or regions like the EU or the US, they have enormous amount of power against this technology company because they have the most sophisticated consumer markets in the world. In the US, we know this Washington is unable to have a conversation with the Silicon Valley. In Europe, we have made progress with the GDPR, but in Europe, we don't have Googles or Microsoft, right? We don't have technology company like we have. So rethinking global governance is a critical part on how you rethinking globally, but try to act locally with the uh, intent of protecting your, your citizenship. We can do this. We can use data in a way that is not going to profile people by making anonymous, by having only part of the data structured, but it requires engagement from the technology companies as well as governments to move forward. And I know it's not an easy conversation, but it largely will reshape the competitiveness background of in the future if we do that. If we don't, we will become data colonies as uh, Yuval Harari, that I think you already have, likely calls it, right? I, I met him um, a couple of years ago and he was calling about data colonies, right? A country that will become subsidies in many ways. Well, I, I don't like this second scenario. Uh, let's say it's better to, to, to start some kind of uh, uh, finding the agreement. And uh, yeah. well, 
at the moment, I personally don't see, uh, just to, to a little bit to pursue this subject, I personally don't see uh, this discussion uh, about this is growing on. Let's say on the, on the first slide was Elon Musk, or it looks like Elon Musk a bit. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, he actually, f uh, some years ago, raised these uh, huge concerns about artificial intelligence and the necessity to, uh, to, to regulate it and to start a discussion how it's regulated. What we have at the moment, at the moment, every algorithm, uh, uh, became artificial intelligent. Uh, therefore, you know you don't you don't you don't need to be afraid because everything you you meet is artificial intelligent. At least like uh, it sounds like this in in marketing, uh, and there is no discussion about uh, regulation uh, really. AE. And you mentioned uh, the approach of China, which potentially is uh, difficult. So, do you know uh, these moves uh, towards uh, uh, you know avoiding this um, uh, scenario of colonies of digital colonies? <laughs> So, uh, Slava, I think so. Let, there has been, I would say, very promising steps to try to move us against the scandals, right? So the problem with technology is the fact that when you triangulate in data, you can easily profile and predict. We saw this with Oxford Analytica and the election of Trump a few years ago on the scandal that Facebook actually uh, you know, went through on how the poor regulation really allowed um, a political uh, opponent to eventually gain traction against another ones. And we see that likely social media has been responsible for creating a lot of polarization in the social, in the uh, political spectrum, because we created these eco chambers of information that are fundamentally creating news and fake news at the same time, right? So I think this is a challenge that we had. I have seen uh, the GDPR being shaped around the US. The US hasn't yet launched it. I think uh, um, the Biden is uh, probably try to think what will be the best way for a GDPR in the US to be uh, launched because of course the large vested interest that lobbies have. I saw this in the Gulf. Um, I spent some of my time in Dubai so I can see how the Emirates have been trying to build something similar to the GDPR. And there are some, let's say, copy-paste models around mm -hmm. the world rethinking privacy. Um, China is a question mark in many ways. Uh, the country, has, as you know, introduced uh, the social credit score, which is a way of measuring people's performance according to an algorithm. And that gives you access to renewal of passport or speed of the internet, or none of this. It's a quite dangerous thing about a very dystopian view of humanity, right, in many ways. And Chinese surveillance on a global level is a problem that we need to figure out. I think that China has not been engaged yet in the degree of transparency we want to have, but we haven't really engaged with China in the right ways. I think we have been antagonizing a lot. The problem that I see with all of this is that no matter what we think of China, we can't leave it out of the conversation. It's too big and too critical. We, I think we've been in the West, we've been trying to sideline it and isolate it and marginalize it by thinking the West and China. The challenge is it's not going away if we're not engaging directly with China. China has a role on a global level that needs to be engaged, but I haven't seen that direction from the perspective of technology. I saw it elsewhere, and I think it's really a make it and break it situation. If we are understanding this in the right way, we likely will see technology starting to do what technology is designed to do, which is empowering people and society. If we don't, we're gonna go back to our review that will become so like a black mirror, right? In many ways, uh, conditioned greatly on the control of technology from very few companies. So this is why I think it is, uh, a period of our history where we are defining the future as we speak. Nothing has been written yet, but it's a critical moment for sure. Oh yes, that's uh, uh, many agrees. <laughs> many, 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 many agree about this. Uh, but like, it was still moving to to a next C, but climate. Um, um, uh, but with your book together, it's it's, it's already 
on the shelf or almost on the shelf this uh, the the group of professors a group of uh, authors from the club of rome actually to um, somehow celebrate or remark this 50th anniversary of the first book the limits of the growth uh, published yeah. the book about s for all uh, survival guide for, guide for humanity uh, and actually the models, they actually they renew and checked, at least in the announcement, the model showed that uh, if going in the same way we are going now, uh, uh, actually we, we shall be facing uh, a heightened risk of regional societal collapse. Yes. Uh, and, and, and that is more or less clear. Uh, like, you know, the Herbert Stein law, what's, uh, what is inevitable will happen, um, uh, some, something like this. Uh, uh, so in this respect, uh, uh, do you see again, like like it is crypto and this di digital data? Do you see uh, some kind of a, sorry sustainable efforts of the global community, global uh, 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 humanity? Let's call it humanity to to yeah. uh, uh, to to move uh, practically uh, to how to call it, not to avoid it totally, because the material world uh, is developing. And uh, anyway, we cannot stop, in my opinion, materially by calculating this CO, CO emission or whatever. But but actually right. to, to somehow prevent this social big, great conflicts to happen because of. Yeah, Slava, such a difficult question. I have to say. <laughs> that's, my, that's my role. I don't have Yeah, I, I, and I know that. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I have to say that since few years, the narrative has changed. And I'm not sure whether it will be enough to change the narrative. But I think before, we were much more about climate change. We were thinking about the uh, degree of temperature that was rising. We were thinking about social responsibility. We were thinking about reducing emissions. The narrative was very incremental or decremental. The challenge with climate is that climate is not a linear problem, it's a non-linear one. Therefore, it generates a degree of complexity that is not about the switch that you turn on and turn off. Today, I think we start understanding more about the fact that reforming our industrial systems within the planetary boundary is becoming a critical function of competitiveness because the countries that are competitive are countries that are managing within planetary boundary because they have been able to find some degree of balance between economic prosperity, but also social prosperity, the progress of a society to basically looks after itself and its weakest members. So I think the narrative has shifted. What made it different, I think, was the fact that investors started to see, let's call them sustainable companies as much more lucrative, of course, because they have less externalities, their company, they're managed much, much more seamlessly. So I think the, the financial sector now is involved, which is a player that we didn't have for many years because they couldn't find a financial case for it. I also see that the SDG, the sustainability goals, have been an excuse for many countries to contemplate the questions, what, our, what is our 2030 view? And in some parts of the world, I have seen significant changes moving towards 2030. Let's be clear, we will not meet the SDG by 2030, but we will have made enough progress for us to grade to the next level of maturity for rethinking the relationship with the climate, not as a trade-off, but basically how do we build economic prosperity around the limitation that we have, which is not negative, it's just rethinking the paradigm. To finish on this, says uh, Lava, um, the oil producers started to realize that oil and gas is a very volatile commodity because they can go from $150 all the way down to 33. We have a war that started to realize the dependency on gas from Russia was an historical mistake that generated so much dependency that we have no leverage. And this has accelerated the rethinking about portfolios, alternative form of energy, but also rethinking energy as a concept. So a number of different factors are happening that might point us in the right direction. That said, Slava, we both know it might not be enough, or it might be enough for a tipping point that we still don't know where it's coming from. But for sure, let's say that we had this conversation 10 years ago, 
I would have told you that I was seeing a different type of engagement I see right now. It doesn't mean it's better, but it's definitely a different narrative. I agree with you, but uh, one of the scenario of the Club of Rome is just too little, too late. <laughs> See, sure. it, it's good to be moving, and that's obviously uh, uh, the issue is that the pace of the of the move is also is also very important. Um, uh, the next easy or not very easy question: uh, your 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 last book with uh, with uh, uh, not to speak about China, let's speak about India, uh, and then yeah. uh, mentioned Amit uh, uh, Kapoor, our, our colleague sure. and friends, uh, and. Uh, and you 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 wrote a book together with him, uh, and the question would not be about the book, but there's a, always some kind of a dream on imagined economies about leapfrogging and catching the developed uh, countries by some uh, kind of um, principled approach or, or, or whatever. Um, uh, so and I, and I'd like uh, knowing uh, based on on your research, but also not based on your research whether it's you believe it's possible and how it's feasible uh, uh, to do in particular speaking of ukraine um, uh, we are in the same position we are much uh, uh, less on gdp per, per head uh, uh, well and every time uh, as our one of our economists um, observed uh, every time when we reached uh, some kind of a four uh, plus thousand per head uh, uh, some kind of a war started uh, uh, around so russia doesn't want us to be to be rich at all so yeah. how emerging economies could let's say leapfrog uh, to, to catch the development countries easy uh, thanks for thanks yeah another <laughs> another easy one uh, let me briefly share Oops. Mark, we lost you. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, me here. Yeah, sorry, just got connected to my phone for some reason. Um, so to the uh, question you're asking, you know, we do have examples of, of countries that have been able to leapfrog, to use a term that we often use in, in uh, economic policy, right? Um, I think today that conversational leapfrogging is no longer more about, you know, the diligence of the fiscal and monetary policy, the alliance, yeah. the relationship with the currency, but much more about how small countries or large countries can fundamentally rethink their, their structure. There's a, there's a clear idea about keeping the relationship between federal and municipal or urban in a healthy state in which we have in cities uh, driving and propelling the innovation part and uh, the federal level basically working on the macro picture. So mainly the stability of the currency, large infrastructure. So I think you can definitely grow by rethinking the governance between regional and, 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 and federal um, because cities are much more better equipped to really drive pro progress forward. We saw those a lot with uh, cities that have fundamentally shaped uh, the destiny of countries. Quick example, about 10 years ago, a country like Portugal would be facing a uh, fear of defaults. And suddenly the large work done in the infrastructure in Lisbon and Porto largely moved some of the industry to the region, shaped the infrastructure, and eventually got the country to become an interesting part of uh, uh, Eastern Europe, right? That is uh, Western Europe that is now attracting a lot of, uh, of uh, investors that we never seen before. Yeah, we saw this already in the Baltic, you know, the whole uh, former Soviet of uh, the Baltic Republic. We always talk about Estonia, for example, in many of our classes. Country that were able to prioritize technology, building the first e-government portal in, uh, in Europe. I happen to uh, um, to meet the former president of Estonia asking, how would you make this possible? And he said, we have no option but to become a digital nation. And today, uh, you know, Estonia is nonetheless a country that has been pioneering the idea of the e-residence. There was a time, Slava, where Estonia was the only country. Today, we can count roughly 70 or 75 countries globally that have some form of digital residency moving forward. So I think there are ways for growing the economy to the next level by rethinking at first this balance between uh, macro and micro, so federal and regional, and also by using technology to largely rethinking the competitive landscape. 
the last example I will make, a small country like Israel was a country that was not really very productive a few years ago because it was uh, a country largely dependent on subsidies. But the transformation of Tel Aviv as a venture capital hub rethought, rethought basically startup ecosystems. And today, lots of investment are coming. I would have never imagined that two years ago in Dubai, I could see Israeli businessmen coming to the region, doing business, normalizing the relationship between the UAE and Israel. And that's because Israel has become a digital nation with capital that now are investing globally. So I would love for Ukraine to think of itself um, within the idea of becoming a digital nation, capable of building on the current capacity. I was uh, stunned to discover the number of technology company that Ukraine has produced over the last few years. That maybe where they were started in Ukraine but ended up in the EU or in US, right? So you don't know them as Ukrainian company, but the original idea was coming from Ukrainian founders. There is a lot of uh, emphasis on rethinking infrastructure. I was uh, making a, a presentation where Kiev was considered to be already one of the smart cities and how they were using digital infrastructure to engage citizens. That's the way forward, Slav. I don't know whether it will be a leapfrog, but it's clearly the way into the future for a country that has uh, all the assets to uh, rethink of itself as a 21st century country, less dependent on commodities and much more about you know advanced exchanges that happen through the digital economy. That's, I think, where leapfrog might happen. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I'd like to comment, but not 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 really. I uh, I like uh, 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 and use actually even in lecture in your book about understanding how the future unfolds and your uh, drive framework uh, about 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 this. Um, well, it's five years since you published the book, uh, so looking at current perspectives, like whatever, would you add anything? Uh, 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 to uh, uh, to this understanding, some new ideas appeared uh, since then. COVID, uh, uh, war, Taiwan, uh, at Ukraine, um, or, or, or just the same. I mean, this this idea of this unexpected, foreseeable but unexpected events, which nobody discussed a few years ago, but currently yeah. actually they changed the world, is uh, is is disturbing. So, uh, so what... uh, the only element, I, I think the, the framework kept on being um, useful for our understanding of, you know, the, uh, the events at the macro level. What I uh, personally was underestimating is the power of governments and, uh, and geopolitics. You know, I, I was under the impression that we were in a period of our history where uh, relationship between country were basically quite stable. Uh, and I was thinking this is much more about private sector game, more about consumers, market. I wasn't really uh, expecting geopolitics becoming such a major driver of uh, transformation. Um, and I think this is the only elements of drive that I think we could not anticipate when we wrote the book, is that the power of how geopolitics and government truly can change overnight the destiny of a country or destiny of, of millions of people in the bad and the good ways, to be honest. Right? And I think this is something that a uh, big lesson learned. This is why the next books have been more about, you know, governments, policy. I go back to my roots as an economist in understanding that for me, economic development start by understanding macro and micro with equal respect for the two sides. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, uh, typically I ask the last question about some personal, you know, people, sure. uh, you, you brought so many uh, uh, great, new, important, uh, sophisticated, uh, uh, clear ideas. Uh, uh, could you say a few words at the end uh, about uh, uh, what do you like additionally to write in books <laughs> and thinking of these ideas uh, uh, about uh, family or, or interest? Of course, love. I mean, uh, family is uh, the foundation for 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 me at least, what really has been uh, uh, important to always remember what I do, what I do for. Um, I also enjoy travel. I, I feel myself uh, uh, a child of, uh, of the, the world in many ways. So I grew up uh, as an international family in North America, move over to Europe, uh, you know, love to go to Asia, uh, leave part of my time in Middle East. I mean, I, I feel myself at home in many places. 
it's difficult for me to answer the question, where are you from? It's one of the questions I try to uh, suffer the most, right? And then, yeah, outdoors and spending time, uh, you know, uh, with uh, with my kids. Uh, things like this, I, I I think they define greatly who I am fundamentally. Um, so, yeah, uh, never appears in some of the work I do, uh, but I think is really what uh, holds me true to myself at the end of the day. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I, I do look forward that uh, for the day uh, to, that you will be able to come to, to, to Kyiv, to Ukraine. Actually, it's even still possible and will be, you know, unforgettable event <laughs> crossing all the streets back and forth without the airplanes. Uh, but I believe uh, this day will come. Um, uh, you, you brought a lot of ideas and you will have a, a nice audience listening. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, our certain advance in IT and development, the digital transformation and all the ideas. Uh, this is also a subject of, uh, of interesting discussion, which I'd love to continue uh, uh, next time. Uh, and uh, now it's time just to uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for, for bringing this idea to us, for finding the time to share. Uh, and for all our participants, uh, I'd like to remind that our project is uh, on full pace. Uh, we shall meet uh, in one week at 6 p.m. on 20, uh, of 28th of, uh, I'll get time, for 28th of uh, September. And we shall meet uh, Dr. Megan Wright, uh, who will speak about how to tell or how to speak truth. Uh, which is important uh, every word, so almost, uh, 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 I mean, the, to speak and to the truth, uh, which also, uh, and, and the, 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 it is, the world is changing, it's a very critical time in order how we speak and also what is the truth. Uh, so I invite you uh, to join and like to remind you that you're still, uh, uh, I mean, addressing the participants, uh, uh, you're still uh, capable and it is still possible to make a donations on our website and um, uh, the money collected will be directed to support Ukrainian women, uh, temporarily displaced Ukrainian women that would like to uh, start their own businesses. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, uh, Mark, once again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was really an uh, intellectual delight uh, to have been talking to you, uh, and I'm looking forward uh, for the next opportunity uh, meeting you. Uh, goodbye, uh, thank everybody. You thank you. All. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me. The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com.